In my documentary, The Kammer Coincidence, I tell the story of me, Brian Kammer, discovering the Austrian scientist Paul Kammer within the pages of a book called Time Loops by Eric Wargo. Immediately upon posting the doc, I reached out to Eric Wargo. He was kind enough to watch it, and he even reported an interesting coincidence. Here it is. So, I discovered his book in the background of a Jesse Michaels video. Now, apparently, Jesse and Eric had been trying to arrange an interview for two years. Their interview was scheduled to happen a few days after I sent the doc. And though this coincidence is mild, our communication would, in fact, lead to a string of truly amazing happenings. And I'll get into those, but first I'd like to talk about Time Loops. Time Loops is a well-researched and expertly composed deep dive into the concept and study of precognition. It explores the idea that an unconscious mind exists simultaneously in the past, present, and future, and it's only our conscious mind that is stuck within the confines of perceptual time. Thus, in dreams or in the throes of a creative trance, our conscious mind is able to remember the future in the same way we remember the past. Quick side note, obviously, time loops, precognition, these ideas will be dismissed instantly by a lot of people as paranormal. But when you're dealing with time and you write off any paranormal sounding explanations of time, you're stuck with normal explanations of time. And I don't know about you, but when I try to read up on the current normal mainstream physical explanations of space-time, it sounds virtually indistinguishable from the paranormal to me. Physicists are constantly saying that time is merely an illusion, String theory suggests there's 11 dimensions, or 10, I can never remember, and quantum mechanics prove that the universe is not locally real. So back to retrocausation, or time loops. Now in my coincidence documentary, I give this example of a famous coincidence. A patient tells Carl Jung of a dream in which an authority figure presents her a meaningful golden beetle. They immediately hear a tapping at the window, and Carl cracks it to find a beetle and gently presents it to her. But now let's look at this story not as a remarkable concurrence of events without causality, but instead as an example of retrocausation. The patient has a precognitive dream of an authority figure giving her a beetle. She tells Carl, they hear the tapping, and find the beetle. And in this moment, Carl realizes this is the dream, and thus proceeds to sort of act it out. This is the time loop. You see, upon discovering the faded beetle, Carl only went through the motions of presenting it to the patient because of the dream they'd just discussed. And yet, it was this reenactment of the dream that caused the patient to have the precognitive dream. This is retrocausation. This is a time loop. So precognition happens in dreams, but also happens in waking life. In my documentary, I talk a little bit about the experience of writing akin to something like a trance. It does not feel like I'm consciously choosing words, but instead like I'm channeling from some source unknown. Lots of writers have this experience. One of my favorite writers, Cormac McCarthy, points out that this feeling of channeling language also lends itself to everyday conversation. When I'm talking to you, I don't know what I'm going to say next. I know what the subject is. Yeah. I have a vague sense, but but I'm going to say something, and it will be in a, in a coherent sentence yeah. that I will say, and you will understand. Yeah. But it's not like it's not like some part of my brain is making up sentences and then whispering to me, and then I repeat them. You know that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And it's not like the next sentence I'm going to say to you. It's an idea, but it's not a sentence, and yet. Almost immediately, I will form it into a sentence. Exactly. It, it's like when you try and explain something to somebody, and you say, "Let me think about that. How can I put this?" Okay, put what? What's the this that you're trying to put? Mm -hmm. You're trying to put it in words, but you don't have them yet. Yeah. But the idea is there. But it's not. It's not. The idea exists independently of language, and that's a problem. And then once again, he takes it back to dreams. And so he fell asleep in front of the fire and he had this dream of the Eurobarus, the snake with its tail in its mouth. And he woke up and he said, oh my God, the configuration of the benzene molecule is a ring. Yeah. And so the question is, well, if the, if the unconscious figured that out, which it did, why couldn't it just say, Kekulé, it's a ring. 
Oh, okay, got it. Now, Cormac speaks about this stuff in a way that I think most of us tend to think about it. Psychologically speaking, we often think of the unconscious mind as almost a separate entity that lives inside us and whispers great mathematical insights or musical compositions to our conscious mind. I think this is what Freud taught us to think about our psychologies when he originally conceived of the id and the superego. And even in my explanation of time loops just now, I made it sound like our unconscious mind is an entity unstuck in time and occasionally reporting news from the future. But I think Eric in his book tries to get us to think about all of this differently. The unconscious mind is not some helpful entity that reports from the future, but instead the entire phenomenon of the unconscious is merely a symptom of the fact that our consciousness has this perceptual experience of linear time while actually we simultaneously exist in the past, present, and future all at once. Maybe you're confused at this point, and that's because this concept is hard to deal with in blanket philosophical statements, and also because I'm probably too dense to lay it out there properly. That's why Eric's book is layered with incredible instances of precognition from the past, and he does a great job explaining all the previous scientific theories and studies that have led him to this explanation. Speaking of the incredible, so immediately after talking to you, 20 minutes later, I'm driving to a friend's house and I come across a man sitting in his car. The man tells me that he's out of gas, asks if I will help him push his car. So I get into my car and push him off of a main road. Then I ask if he's okay at this point and then he asks for a ride to the gas station. So I, I give him a ride to the gas station. The next day I decide to use my read the Bible in a year app that I have on my phone. Think about our conversation. What do I want to talk about in time loops? Oh, I really like the Philip K. Dick section. We should talk about that. Go from the Bible to a video about Philip K. Dick. And the first video that I click tells the story of Philip finding a man who is out of gas on the road, helping him, and then giving him a ride to the gas station. And then realizing after the fact that he had written this in a book previously, but then telling a, a priest about this whole story and the priest explaining that this was actually a story in Acts in the Bible where a man named Philip comes across a man in a chariot, uh, an Ethiopian man, and, and helps him along the way. And I also thought, the chariot aspect, the fact that I was literally like pushing his car that that was not motored, <laughs> just more like a chariot, it felt even, even more profound. I mean, I lost my mind. I, I've told everybody about this. And, and then I immediately emailed you. You know, I didn't want to give you the impression that I was going to be like emailing you every day <laughs> for the rest of my life since we had just gas emailed station. He's out of gas. Before. So he gets back in his car, he goes, finds the guy, takes him to the gas station, and as he's pulling up at the gas station, he realizes, hey, this is in my book too. This exact station, this exact guy, everything. So this whole episode is, is kind of creepy, right? And he's telling his priest about it, you know, describing how he wrote this book, and then four years later, all these things happened to him. And as he's telling it to him, the priest says, that's the book of Acts. You're describing the book of Acts. And he's like, I've never read the book of Acts. So he, you know, goes home and reads the book of Acts and it's like, you know, uncanny. You know, even the